Well, good morning again. Um, as some of you know, John's down in San Diego this weekend, so he doesn't get to preach the text that I quote unquote assign him. Um, so instead, I get to preach the quote that I, the text that I assign me. So if it's bad, it's all my fault anyway. <laughs> um, but as you know, we've been going through the Psalms and uh, this whole summer, and. Um, yeah, part of the joy of this series has been hearing some of your songs being written. Um, and today we're going to read another one. It's called In the Silence. In the silence, it all begins to make sense. You are there. I am beginning to feel your presence. Laying aside the distractions and worries, that clutter my mind and invade my senses, the fear and confusion that try to lure me away. When I set my spirit, my thoughts, and my senses on you, Lord, the concerns in my life fade. Your presence begins to illuminate calm, peace, joy, contentment, like your creation, the innocence of an animal or an infant, the outstanding presence of the mountains and valleys and all that is in between. Your gift for us to enjoy and nurture. Selah, praise your name. In the silence, your loving care fulfills me. What more do I need? These moments come and go. And though I wish they would linger, this taste of heaven in the silence. And today our scripture comes from Psalm 121. And will you read with me? I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. Amen. Let's pray. So, Lord, as we look at your word this morning, we ask first that you open our eyes and open our ears to hear your spirit speaking to us. We pray that you soften our hearts so that we will be ready to go where you send us. Meet us where we are this morning and bring us to where we need to be. May we hear what you have to say for us this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. So I don't know why, but this is one of those psalms that I've continually come back to all my Christian life. And um, perhaps it's because, you know, there's a lot of evocative imagery in it. We lift up our eyes to the hills. You know, we have, the Lord's our shade at our right hand protection from the sun and moon. This is powerful images that grab me. And um, so perhaps it's the poetry of the psalm that I like so much. In fact, if you ever take a look at the music I've written, you'll, you're going to find that these images and these themes, you know, somehow sneak their way into my music all over the place. Most of the time without me even realizing it. I'm like, oh, that's a cool lyric. Oh yeah, that's Psalm 121. Well, I think what initially drew me to this psalm is that the psalmist is so calm and he's so assured in his, assur in his assertions. When he says in verse 1, I lift up my eyes to the hills, where does my help come from? He's not asking some question of existential angst. Where does my help come from? He's not asking the question hoping someone else knows the answer. But the psalmist knows this answer with absolute clarity. My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. There is no question in his mind of this answer. He can answer this question because he knows 
Because this is something that he knows deep within his bones. This is not some newfound belief that he just discovered yesterday. But this is a truth that has been planted deep into the heart of the psalmist. I lift up my eyes to the hills where does my help come from. It comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. This is the center of the psalmist's faith. This is the anchor that grounds him. And in writing the psalm, because as you know, all these psalms are not just personal poems to the Lord. These are songs that are meant to be sung by the people of God. So when the psalmist wrote this psalm, he's inviting each and every one of us to, to have that same faith, to sing that same song, to know deep in our bones that our help is not found in the things of this world, but our help comes from the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. Now this is all good, but ultimately what keeps me coming back to this psalm is this enigma. Because this psalm, more than any other psalm, seems to elicit different responses in me, depending on my stage of life. You know, when everything is going well, at least most of my life is going well, there's no major crisis that I have to deal with, no fires to put out, no life decisions that hinge. See, this psalm seems true. It's a confirmation, it's a comfort. My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will keep me from all harm. But then when the crisis comes, and they almost always do, when sickness arrives at the, my door, when I don't know what to do next, then the psalm almost sounds like it's mocking me. The psalm doesn't become a comfort. It becomes almost grating because the psalmist seems to be writing all of this out of a place of pure naivety. How can the Lord keep me from all harm? when the evidence of harm is all around me? How can the Lord be watching over me when I'm obviously drowning in the troubles that surround me? What happens when my foot slips? Because it does sometimes. What happens when my help does not seem to come? What happens when failure, when defeat, when death seem to be at our doorsteps? What happens when we're persecuted and we're shamed, when calamity and misfortune greet us? And so in this psalm, we are confronted with that age-old problem. If the Almighty God protects us, if He's supposed to keep us from all harm, then why do bad things keep happening? And at least in my experience, we try and reason it out one of two ways. Either we think the problem is obviously us. Maybe we're not faithful enough. Maybe if we prayed more, maybe if we gave more, maybe... If we, maybe we're facing all this because God is angry at us. We lay the blame on ourselves. Or worse yet, as I have experienced, we, we the self-righteous who are not in calamity and trouble, lay the blame on the ones who are suffering. Because obviously God promised to protect and keep us, to watch over us, to be our help. If that is not evident in our lives, then it's just a case of us being not faithful enough. So we either blame ourselves, or we take the other path, and we blame God. Maybe the problem isn't us. Maybe it's just that God is making some promises he can't back up. Perhaps the reason we fall on hard times has less to do with our unfaithfulness, and more to do with the fact that maybe God is not as powerful as we thought him to be. Perhaps the reason we're in despair and troubles is because God is not as watchful as he said he would be. Perhaps it's not me. It's you, God. I remember feeling especially cynical about this psalm when I went through the height of my depression in college. You see, my depression did not hit me when I was far away from God, when I was inactive or complacent in my faith. My depression hit me the hardest when I was in the middle of my chapel internship. <laughs> it was at the moment when I found myself coming most alive and when I was rediscovering my passion for worship, for music, for the presence of God in the midst of all this. It came out as I was surrounded by a group of Christian peers and friends, each of us supporting one another, encouraging one another, loving one another. It came when I, 
I, I was doing a chapel internship in college, and I was also, my major was religion in a Christian college. You can't get more churchy than that. <laughs> it came when I was at the height of my passion for studying the Bible, height of my passion of studying theology. More than any other time in my life, I felt that my life was surrounded by church and by God, and yet here I was, with barely any energy to get out of bed. Here I was, pouring everything I had into worship, into this chapel program, and leaving feeling empty, not filled. Here I was doing everything I could to be faithful, yet the darkness was not lifting. And don't get me wrong, I didn't think I was perfect. I knew I was still sinful. I knew there were still things that I needed to work on. I knew I still needed forgiveness. But it felt for the amount of work I was putting in, I really wasn't getting much in return. No matter what I did, the help that comes from the Lord seemed a long way off. Rather being, than being kept from harm, it felt like I was up to my neck in harm and danger. And so I began to wonder as I stumbled across Psalm 121 again, was this psalm true? Or was it naive and simplistic in its view of the world? Was it just a case of the author using a lot of poetic license was it just hyperbole? And it's only been very recently, as I've looked at the psalm again, that I've realized that maybe the issue isn't us. Maybe the issue isn't God. Maybe the issue is, I've just read the psalm wrong all my life. I've always thought that what this psalm was trying to tell me was that as long as we make God our focus, we won't fall into harm. The psalmist was almost promising a trouble-free life for us as believers. And you can't blame me, we can't blame me too much because isn't that what, exactly what it reads in verse 7? The Lord will keep you from all harm. And I think the reason I read the psalm, was, psalm wrong was because I completely misunderstood what that verse was talking about. Because in our minds, when we read, the Lord will keep you from all harm, what we hear is the Lord is going to prevent any harm from coming across us. What we hear is God's going to let us escape peril and trouble and woe. And if that is what this verse really means, and if this is what the Lord really promises, then I'll say it. Then God is a liar. <laughs> because no honest Christian will ever be able to say, that their walk with the Lord has been harm-free and trouble-free. In fact, most of the disciples would not be able to say that their walk with the Lord was harm-free. But so I decided to go deeper, and I did a study. I'm going to nerd everyone out. I did a study <laughs> of this word in verse 7. Keep. What does that word mean? And it comes from the Hebrew word shamar. And you can imagine my surprise when I found out that, no, what this word does not mean is not prevent. It does not mean let us escape. But rather, when we say the Lord will keep us from all harm, at the heart of this, it means that the Lord will preserve us. In fact, I was reading in the commentary that a better way to translate this verse is not the Lord will keep you from all harm. It is the Lord will preserve us in all harm. And so the promise that God makes to us is not, we will have a pain-free life, but that in, in all the harm that this world is going to throw at us, we will not be destroyed. God will preserve us. And the difference between the two is very subtle, but it is so important. Because if what God promises is the prevention of any harm, then what he's inviting us to do is to live some sort of escapist existence, divorced from human experience. He's encouraging us to shun suffering, to shut out pain and brokenness. He's calling us to look at those who are suffering as somehow being less than us. If God tells us, that he's keeping us from all harm. But if God promises to preserve us in all harm, 
Then he's telling us that there is nothing on earth that will take us away from him. Then the promise is that in every circumstance, we will not be abandoned. Then this psalm echoes Romans 8. Neither death, nor life, neither angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So it's not that the pain and suffering will be absent from our lives, but rather it is that the world can throw all the harm it can at us, but it can never pry us away from God's hands. We can fall sick. We can be persecuted. We can be impoverished, poor. We can be homeless. We can be depressed, anxious, and confused. We can be abused, tortured, beaten, bruised. We could fall to the lowest rung in society. We can be abandoned and unloved. And we could even face death. But in all harm, God preserves us in his arms. When we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we do not fear because God is with us. So it's not saying we're going to be spared pain and sorrow, but saying that all the suffering of today will never overwhelm us, it will never destroy us, because we will be held for all times and all eternity in God's arms. And it's like that old spiritual song says, we shall overcome someday. The Lord will see us through someday. We will have the victory someday. And so when the psalmist says, lift up your eyes to the hills and see where your help comes from, he's calling for us to let this truth sink deep into our hearts. Let this truth become our center. The Lord will preserve you in all hearts. The psalmist invites us to do this because we live in a world where this simple fact, the Lord will not let us go, is something we so easily forget because we are a people highly distracted and easily frazzled. I saw a study recently on, uh, I guess it was on <clears throat> Forbes, but it was about Facebook and they had done a recent study on people and they actually got into a lot of trouble because they weren't telling us they were experimenting on us. Kind of a no-no, ethically. But what they found out was uh, they went over a week. They did an experiment for a week where they took a random selection of Facebook users and what they did was either remove from their Facebook feed all the positive posts that were on there or they removed from their Facebook feed all the negative posts. And you know what they found out? That the people who only had negative posts on their wall, you know what ended up happening? Their post would be negative. And the people who had more positive posts on their wall, or all positive posts, their posts became chirpier, at least for most people. And what struck me was that even something as trivial and pointless as our Facebook feeds <laughs> have the profound power to influence our behavior and shape our outlook on life. We are a people highly distracted and easily frazzled. It doesn't take much to shake our beliefs. Just a little bit of added stress is enough to make us run helter-skelter. It only takes a little crisis to convince us that what we need to do is take matters into our own hands that we need to come up with a solution, that salvation is contingent on our actions. And so I'm reminded of that song, Come Thou Found. Because we are people prone to wander, people prone to leave the God I love. Our natural inclination is to find everything apart from God as our source of meaning and strength. And so this is why the psalmist tells us right off the bat, look up. We are people easily distracted, so look up. We are easily fooled, so look up. We are people easily scared, look up. 
we make our own idols, so look up. Look up to the mountains, to where your help comes from, because we are quick to forget. And we are much quicker to look down and to look all around us when trouble and danger comes. Even Peter, you know, who we look to as a human founder of our church, he fell into the same trap. <clears throat> he was more worried about the waves at his feet and the storm around him. And he could not even see Christ standing right in front of him, saying, come out onto the water with me. Similarly, we are entrenched in our own problems. We stare at a metaphorical storm surrounding us. We live in a world where we hope we don't end up on the next list of cutbacks, where our bodies frequently remind us how limited our time on earth is, where we hope to make our next mortgage payment, where we seem to be one misstep away from disaster, and we are encouraged to be a people of fear. Our impulse is to either shut ourselves in and weather the storm, or frantically do everything in our power to curate and control our surroundings. And so the psalmist tells us, look up and realize that our salvation does not lie in our own hands. Our salvation does not lie in solving our own problems, but our help comes from the Lord. And when we learn to embrace this fact and allow it to occupy the center of our lives, then we find the grace, then we find the courage, then we find the strength and the hope to face the valley of the shadow of death. Now, of course, this sounds all grand. I'm sure we've heard this all before. But it's always a case of easier said than done. Usually our best efforts to keep God and the hope of his help and salvation at the center of our lives, they fail. And as much as we try, our eyes wander elsewhere. So I started thinking, what is it about the psalmist that can that he can say this with such confidence and certainty. And what I realized is that, again, this is not a belief that he came to overnight. The psalmist did not become this assured and centered automatically. And, and it's important to remember that God, our help and our maker, does not expect us to come to this automatically. But instead, what he has done is he has given us ways and means to help us along the way, to make it so that what sounds unnatural to say, our help comes from the maker of heaven and earth, becomes pure instinct. He has given us reminders of his grace and mercy all around. He has done this first by giving us, God has done this first by giving us his word. In his spirit. And yeah, I know. Read your Bible, pray every day. It's not the most innovative thing in the world. In fact, it sounds too simple. But what I'm struck with is that the times I felt most most stable in my life, and I'll be honest, currently it's about 50-50. But the times I felt most stable in my life, now by stable I mean I don't mean trouble-free or harm-free but most stable, is when I found myself simply reading the Bible more and praying. Meanwhile, I've devoted much more effort to figuring out ways and means to get around having to read my Bible and pray. You know? I say, you know, God, it's, you know, it's quality, not quantity. You know? <laughs> if I read five chapters in one day, I'm good for the rest of the week. Um, <laughs> I try and do all these things, try and substitute the simple act of read your Bible, pray every day, and I found myself adrift. And perhaps part of my problem, part of all of our problems is that in the past, the phrase read your Bible, pray every day, it sounds like a direct command with negative repercussions if we fail to obey it. Um, it somehow sounds like if we don't read our Bible and pray, you know, God's going to be disappointed and angry with us. And so the reason we try to read the Bible 
and pray so that God just gets off our back. And the exercise is thus defined more by resentment than anything else. I will read my Bible and pray so I can get on with my day. Check the box. <laughs> but as I've come to see, this invitation to read the Bible every day, it's not for God's benefit at all. But God calls us to do it because it is so vital for us. And is the key to having a life centered in Him. God calls us to read the Bible and pray every day because I cannot face the day successfully without a reminder of His grace and who He's called me to be. I will be tempted to fear and despair if I don't remind myself daily that I belong to God and He has saved me and He's redeemed me for His glory. I'll be tempted to compromise, to micromanage my existence, to control the circumstances of my life. If I don't remind myself that my God watches over my life, it is my help and sustenance. God has given us His Word and the promise of His Holy Spirit as a constant reminder of His presence and the help and salvation He brings. So the Bible. But second, He... God has also given us this gift of worship and worshiping together. Nowadays, it's become more and more vogue in vogue to say, I'm spiritual, not religious. In fact, we kind of live in the heart of that culture. And I'll admit, I, I have said that before. But what I realized is what, when I said I'm spiritual, not religious, what I was basically saying is that I believe that I can create a faith that works specifically for me, my schedule, and my priorities. And I don't need anyone else for that. Which sounds great, but misses the point. Because if we read the Bible, we will see that God does not call us out to be individuals of faith. But God calls us out to join a faith that finds its home in the presence of the gathered people of God. The book of Psalms itself that we've studied all summer long, these aren't poems to be read in the privacy of our homes. But these were written to be songs sung by the people of God in worship. Even in our psalm today, you'll see at the top of it, it's called the Song of Ascents. It means that this was a song sung during the special feast days of the Jewish year, like Passover. This was kind of like their Christmas carols. This psalm was meant to be expressed by the people of God. And Jesus promises us in Matthew 18, where two or three are gathered in his name. He is there in our midst. There is something mysterious and powerful about the gathering of God's people for worship. For it is when we lift out praises, when we pray for one another, when we hear the word of God spoken, when we break bread, when we drink the cup, there we are reminded profoundly of who we are together and who God has called us to be together. There we have the chance to publicly declare our desperate need for God, and there we are affirmed in knowing that He is with us to the very end of the age. And the truth is that the further we stay away from that, the more we try and assert that we can be spiritual without being religious, the more we deny ourselves the very gift that God has given us, which is called to come. Come and be a part of his gathered people and be changed. So the gifts that God has given us so far are the word and worship. But finally and more profoundly, I think God has given us the gift of each other in helping find our center in Him. As I mentioned earlier, God never intends for us to journey in faith alone. And perhaps the folly of the modern church is that we have so emphasized the importance of your individual faith and your individual salvation that we have forgotten what it means to be a community of faith. But when Jesus called his disciples, he didn't call 12 individuals to live out their faith separately, but he called them to be a radical community together. 
When he left, he didn't say, go and find your meaningful faith alone. But he established a church to be a radical community of faith. And yet, perhaps this is the gift that we use, the, this is the gift of God that we use the least. For most of us here, you know, we come here, spend a good hour in the presence of other believers, which is great. And then spend 20, 30 minutes after the service. And maybe if we're really saintly, we also arrive 10 minutes earlier, before the service, for a grand total of just under two hours. And that becomes our only intentional, meaningful contact with other Christians for the whole week. And then we wonder why it's so hard to focus on everything God has taught us. And then we wonder why it's so easy to fall into despair when crisis comes. But God has given us each other to encourage one another, to pray for one another, to walk alongside one another. In each other, God has given us the means to remember that in every trouble we face, we do not need to despair. He has given us the means to remember that our help comes from the Lord because we can see examples in each and every one of our lives. It is when we walk our faith together, when we pray together, when we love one another, then we find ourselves centered in Him. So that when we go through trials and temptations, which we will, we will go through trials and temptations. We will go through hard times when the world does its best to draw us away from Him. We have this gift of friends, of brothers and sisters in Christ, who each claim the same Savior to get us through. So the more we do, the more we center ourselves in the Word, the more we center ourselves in worship, and the more that we center ourselves in a community of believers, then we become like the psalmist, knowing deep in our hearts the Lord is our help in times of trouble. No matter what happens to us, He will never leave or forsake us. He will watch over us and He will preserve us in all harm forevermore. We pray with you. So, Lord, we lift our eyes up to the hills and we proclaim that you are our help, our maker, that you are the one who watches over us, who preserves us in all harm, who watches our coming and going both now and forevermore. And we ask you, Lord, to just help us keep that in the center. When storms come, when trials come, when pain and suffering come, help us remember that you are our help. You draw us back to you. We ask this in your name. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.